We currently have six viewers, Martha, six viewers. Two minutes, two minutes. One minute, one minute. Thirty seconds. Ready to come to you? About 15 seconds. And 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, step into you. And you're on. Hello, welcome to our live stream event. I am Marta Rañon, Executive Vice President with Southern Caregiver Resource Center. And I am so excited to have so many people signed up today because we have a great program uh, scheduled for you. So at this moment, I am inviting you to uh, bring your water, bring your tea, whatever you want to be uh, drinking as we have this conversation. Then of course, some notepads or paper and a pen because a lot of the information that we're going to be sharing with you is going to be so important. I am, uh, you know, really excited. I know we have um, so many caregivers that are here. And let me tell you, if you haven't connected to our organization, Southern Caregiver Resource Center, and you are caring for someone, um, I especially want to make sure you know our phone number and our website. We're here to support you. Our uh, information is here available to you and our email, uh, I'm sorry, our website is scrc.care or www.caregiversenter.org or you can call us directly, directly at 858 2684432. Our services are free. We provide educational classes, support groups, um, information to help you navigate those difficult challenges that you might be encountering as a caregiver. We know that so many times uh, it's difficult to even know where to begin, uh, what information you might need. And so we want you to know that we are here for you. Today's topic, Who Me, a Brain Research Volunteer, 
is um, is really a, it's going to be a very interesting topic. There is a lot out there in terms of research, clinical trials, uh, information that you and your loved ones can access to, um, you know, obviously to find the cure, but also to maybe uh, mitigate some of the symptoms that uh, they might be feeling or they might be going through. I know that sometimes as caregivers, we want to have it all go away and, um, you know, in being involved with some clinical trial, trials or research can be one step in that direction. So I want to introduce at this time our guest and it it brings me great joy because i have known him for many many years here he is mike splain he is the owner and principal of splain consulting and he has been working in the field of health and long-term care since 1988 he has a proven track record of helping organizations achieve success in advocacy for health and long-term care issues he helps lead clients to successful public policy uh, change by combining his deep knowledge of po uh, policy and program development and management with his skills in public speaking, community organizing, adult education, media strategy, and public health communications. Mike Splain established the Splain Consulting um, uh, business after more than 20 year career in the uh, area of public policy. And actually that's where I met Mike and um, working with advocacy and advocacy related issues at the Alzheimer's Association. He is known worldwide for bringing real uh, uh, the face of, of the problem uh, in terms of public policy and yield success with policy influencers. Mike, welcome. I guess good late afternoon. It's uh, about eight o'clock at night here on the East Coast. Um, hello, San Diego and all the ships at sea. It's fun to be with you. Um, Martha and Roberto are some of our uh, absolutely favorite Californios. <laughs> uh, it's yes. To, it's, if, if you have a choice, it's good to work with friends. So tonight Aww, I want to talk same about, here. Uh, I want to, want to talk about uh, research. Uh, and I'm going to ask Walter to start advancing the slides. So as I said, the topic tonight, who me, a brain research volunteer. Next slide. Uh, it's customary uh, for people to know who one works for. You can see we have a variety of commercial and non-commercial clients, number of university engagements, and I'm the owner of a related company, Displaying Consulting, called Recruitment Partners, LLC, that's completely focused on closing the gap between what we know about Alzheimer's and dementia and its related care and what we could know by working to recruit more human subjects into all kinds of research. I have these commercial relationships, they're on record, they're part of this permanent record, but as usual, none of these have directed this talk. Next slide. So I'll outline of where we wanna to go tonight. I, I wanna to start by doing a review and, and as, as Martha said, uh, your questions can go in the chat. She'll throw them at me when we we will have some time for some open questions and answers at the end of my formal presentation. But I want to review what our images are of research and really talk about the fact that there are a lot of different kinds of research opportunities in the Alzheimer and dementia and caregiving space. It's not all one kind, and maybe that might make it a little more accessible. Uh, I will talk then for a little bit about how humans are protected in the research process and I want to equip you with some of the key words, some of the key vocabulary, so that should you decide to inquire about participating in research because of your vital role um, as a possible volunteer to participate in research, uh, we want to talk about how you are also protected. We'll review quickly uh, where you can sign up, give a couple of examples of studies, and then go into questions and answers. So that's where we're going uh, for the next 30 minutes or so. And I do appreciate your time this evening. So let's get going. Sometimes when we think about research, we think about this guy. Yeah, I know, hideous, isn't he? <laughs> no, not Frankenstein, me. 
Oh, okay, a little humor. I can't see you or laugh or not, so we'll see whether or not it worked at 5 o'clock on an evening. But at any rate, sometimes our images of research are not always positive. Uh, we think that we'll be experimented upon, that we might, if we volunteer in research, we might end up looking like him. But in fact, uh, you know, despite some of these negative images of, of research, we also have positive images of research. Think about the muscular dystrophy telethon. Think about advances in cancer in our own life to, lifetime. You realize this is the fifth, this week is the 50th anniversary of President Nixon going to Congress to declare war on cancer. And although we haven't defeated every kind of cancer, we have fought it to a tie and many people live with cancer as a chronic disease where even 20 years ago, the word cancer struck fear in our hearts because it, it meant a death sentence. So, and the difference in that is research of all kinds that people have participated in. It's not always Frankensteinian. Next slide. So the most common test of a medicine, the most common clinical trial, the most common science experiment to prove whether or not a treatment works or is effective when compared to another one, the most common kind of research that people get involved in are human trials to test pills. Pills come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, and it's probably the most common outcome of research is a medication. But there are other kinds of research. Next slide. For example, very prevalent in the Alzheimer world of late, we've heard an awful lot about infusions. Very common in cancer, kidney care, a number of other diseases. Uh, these infusions, just like pills, have to go through rigorous scientific testing for both safety and effectiveness before they can go to the market, before they can be uh, sold or insurance to pay for them. Uh, so infusions, testing infusions is another form of research participation that people get invited to. Next slide. We also test in the United States and in Europe and Japan and Korea, we also test medical devices. So if you've ever had a, a electrocardiogram, you've ever had a, uh, an EEG, which is an electroencephalograph, uh, or you've uh, many, many other medical devices, dialysis devices, all of these have gone through the same scientific process as if they were a pill or an infusion, a treatment. So medical devices and being involved in testing. And of course, we're a technology mad society. People really think the answers to many, many things lie in technology. And you'll see when you look at a menu of different kinds of clinical trials that people could participate in, to close the gap between what we know about Alzheimer's and caregiving and what we could know, you'll see a number of device and technology trials are part of the rich and varied menu that we have today in the Alzheimer field. Next slide. We also test at the same, with the same scientific rigor, increasingly we're testing care and support interventions. How do we know what works? Well, we could say, well, you know, hundreds of people can't be wrong that are involved in support groups or involved in an education activity. But if nothing else, care and support interventions, if they're to be effective and they're to work across cultures and across race, uh, across uh, education levels, at the very least, and we know Southern Caregiver Resource Center does this all the time, these care and support interventions need to be evaluated. They need to be, uh, we need to get feedback from the people participating in them to see whether or not they were effective. And we know that we, we're not just guessing when they we recommend them to other people. Some care and support interventions increasingly in Alzheimer's have been through the same form of testing, a randomized controlled clinical trial an RCT for short, a randomized control clinical trial, as if they were a pill or a device or an infusion. That's a very high level of evidence. If you come out of a test, a randomized clinical trial test of a care and support intervention, that's almost like a gold star of approval that we know if people replicate it with fidelity, with faithfulness to that original design, of that intervention that they can expect to get the same results. We're involved right now. One of our one of our side jobs 
where we're is doing vet programs. We have a wonderful workshop for families called Thoughtful Hospitalization. It's a 90 minute workshop for Alzheimer caregivers about either preventing or surviving uh, and the, the, both the hospitalization of a person with Alzheimer's and the aftermath, which I would argue is probably the most difficult thing a person with Alzheimer's can do is to go to the hospital unless it's to live alone with Alzheimer's, which by the way, is another area that we're deeply involved in. We have uh, tested thoughtful hospitalization. About 100 people have been through it. It's been through rigorous evaluation. And now we're going into the next stage of testing it. We're going into a controlled uh, evaluation study so that we can go to market with some confidence that if Martha starts teaching thoughtful hospitalization in the same way that we developed it as a care and support intervention, that she and the people that she cares about who are caregivers would expect to get the same results. So care and support intervention, big part of the research portfolio in Alzheimer's today. Next slide. We don't stop there and looking at a menu. Uh, this is <laughs> this is our favorite from who, by the way, resurfaced on television. Uh, one of our favorites from Office Space. Uh, but taking surveys is a form of participation in research. We're all familiar with survey research when we just check a box, red, yellow, or green, or online. But if people encourage people to participate in surveys and gathering information that way, uh, that as the man from the office says, that'd be great. Uh, uh, an impactful but low energy, uh, easy to do sometimes form of being involved in research. Next slide. Uh, Americans, uh, unlike some cultures, Americans have overwhelmingly supported organ and tissue donation for research. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are in terms of the uh, vaccine for COVID, for example, without the strong support across the population for people to make tissue donations. In the case of COVID, it's small vials, small samples of blood that were anonymized. That is, nobody could say whose was whose. Uh, and examined for uh, what could we learn from tissue donation about the COVID virus, about how it mutates, about how it moves on, uh, moves from person to person. All of that came from people volunteering uh, to their tissue. Uh, we are also uh, very familiar with uh, organ donation for research. Uh, give my brain to science. Well, maybe they want it, maybe they won't. But in the Alzheimer field, I will tell you one of the earliest research activities that was coordinated that still persists is in uh, brain thoughtful brain tissue donation for research post mortem. So, all told, next slide. When you think about research, I want you to think that it's a menu, it's not just one thing. So the menu includes simple surveys or cognitive tests that are online that you could be a part of, tissue donation, testing online and offline supports for caregivers or for persons living with Alzheimer's disease, and then medical devices, including advanced imaging, infusions, pills, and injections. So when you hear the invitation from a trusted source, the Southern Caregiver Resource Center, uh, puts the, the call out for, for you to consider participating in research. I want you to have a menu in your mind that it isn't just one thing. And I think increasingly Alzheimer's disease research centers, which you are really blessed in San Diego County to have one of the oldest, most effective and best funded, including with your county tax dollars, Alzheimer's research centers in the world, let alone in the country, in the world uh, in San Diego, you're really uh, beginning to see more and more of this menu approach at the big Alzheimer's centers because one size in many, many things, including getting people to participate in research, does not fit all. It's a menu. Next slide. So how do we uh, how do we deal with people who don't like Star Trek? We follow the prime directive. Okay, again, try a little lame humor at five o'clock on a weeknight. I can't see your faces. It works better on Zoom. Let's say, oh, get rid of the slide if I do this format again. But people follow, people who conduct research are in fact bound by ethics, law, and regulation to follow the prime directive, 
to keep people safe while we are testing in all those ways that I just mentioned we're testing. Next slide. So human subject protection is a prime directive of anybody that is doing any kind of research with human beings. How does that work? Well, people who are asked to participate in research have to provide their informed consent. And even a person with Alzheimer's disease can give assent if they are unable to give informed consent. So informed consent is two parts. Consent, that is, I say yes to the risk. I say yes to the participation in terms of research. And I'm informed. And fr frankly, I'm informed in painful detail, many pages of information about, uh, about the particular study, possible side effects, possible ways in which things could go wrong. Uh, it's, uh, it, th that's how it works, that people who are participating in human subject research must provide their informed consent to participate. In addition, there's very careful monitoring and oversight of research. The Food and Drug Administration, state regulators, even internal regulators within institutions called institutional review boards all provide monitoring and oversight of both the design and the execution of all kinds of research. Any kind of research will provide in the informed consent materials in a very easy to find way, a way for persons involved in the research or their caregivers to make a direct contact in case of any adverse events uh, or any difficulties that come up in the process of somebody participating in research. Lastly, human subjects are protected, but especially because especially with drugs, we take a phased approach to participate in, in testing uh, new substances for treatment. Uh, you may hear of her, the expression, particularly with all the vaccine noise going around, you may have heard phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. These, uh, we take a phased approach uh, in that in, we test drugs through a series of steps of, of more and more subjects and more and more risk. Phase one trials are usually to test merely for safety and they will involve 10 or 15 people, very specialized research facilities do phase one trials. And of course they come after either animal or modeling or other testing uh, of a drug or of a diffusion before we go to a broader test on humans. Phase two trial might be involve a couple hundred people, more than one site. This is where we test the dosage. We now know a drug is safe. We test the dosage and see what the dosage and routine for taking a drug looks like in order to get an effect, to get a treatment effect from a drug. And phase three, the largest phase of all, and again, you don't go from phase one to phase two or phase two to phase three if you don't have safe and positive results. The phase three trials are the bro broadest trials. They're the ones that gather the most information. And this is a, a common vocabulary. So you may see an ad in the paper. Grandpa, what's a paper? Okay, you may see an ad online for a phase three study. You know that that drug or that uh, caregiver intervention or that device is fairly well along in its development. Even so, we still have informed consent, all this monitoring and oversight to protect human subjects and subjects, participants in research are always provided in direct 24 hour contact in case they have any questions or any adverse effects from participating in research. In, in total then, human subject protection, although there is risk, we try to make sure that that risk is as low as possible, tolerable, and where we have to, we re reveal to the human subjects, the participants in research, what those risks might be. Next slide. So we've jumped into some of the key vocabulary, but I'll come back to some of these words. A clinical trial, as I've said, is an experiment of a device or a substance or an infusion uh, for use in humans to see whether or not it's both safe and effective. A randomized clinical trial is a trial in which some people will get the treatment and the some butterfly. people will not. Lynn, thank you. <laughs> Sister-in-law just walked by, sorry about that. 
a family night, guys. What can I tell you? Um, anyway, a randomized clinic, clinical trial is one in which people will be tested with the drug and without the drug. And those that don't get the drug get something called a placebo, a sugar pill. And this is a way of protecting whether or not <coughs> it's the drug that is making something happen or it is people's psychology making something happen. We've talked about phase one and two and three clinical trials. There's a phase four too. This is called aftermarket uh, research. Uh, this is how drugs continue to be tested for safety, information gathered, and subject, sometimes drugs get recalled because even after they've been approved in a clinical trial, when they get used out there in the field and there are problems, this phase four information gathering for which people don't need to volunteer as they do in the other trials, but as companies provide information, it's another layer of protection. Last piece of vocabulary for the night is the phrase inclusion and exclusion criteria. They are, they're pretty simple to understand. Trials uh, try to work with a certain group of people, whether it's their genetic makeup, possibly their racial or ethnic makeup, their age, pre-existing health conditions, and all of these different conditions for the ideal participants in a research trial are called the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So you may see a study that says, we're looking for people 55 to 74, that's it, they would be included. Uh, we're looking for people with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but no related disorders. That would, the no related disorders phrase would be exclusion criteria. So these are key words. They get thrown around fast and loose uh, as if uh, when you go to an Alzheimer research center or talk to an Alzheimer research, they don't understand frequently why everybody doesn't understand these key vocabulary words. Well, we've just given you a leg up on understanding and using these key vocabulary words in research. Next slide. So let me just say that I would argue that the vacancies, the nearly 70,000 vacancies in participation in clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease care and, and care and support around the world is one of the biggest gaps between where we are and where we want to be in terms of progress in the Alzheimer field. 70,000 volunteer opportunities, a lot to think about. And a lot of trials take a long time to fill. The longer they take the time to fill, the, the further our, away we are from results uh, that are going to matter for humans. Uh, I think folks like you that are on this call tonight are vital uh, to progress. And I'd also point out that the number one priority for our federal government's Alzheimer research ad, uh, activity, which is run by and funded through your tax dollars through the National Institute on Aging, the number one priority for the next five years is increasing the number of low and middle income countries as well as communities of color participating in Alzheimer and aging research. Um, we actually are part of a National Institute on Aging uh, grant that is testing a new model of providing community research liaisons in inner city Syracuse, New York, and inner city uh, in the Bronx, two communities of color as a way of both teaching, but also recruiting people into research with community health workers. Uh, because communities of color and persons who live in lower and middle income country are really underrepresented in all Alzheimer research. We think uh, part of the mystery of why Alzheimer persons and families don't participate in research as much is because unlike, for example, in the cancer field, Alzheimer research participation is yet to become a standard of care. And primary care physician attitude and time constraints that they will talk about uh, will frequently discourage people from participating in research. We've also seen it folks, and I hate to say it, and I don't say it about San Diego, but I would tell you that we've seen Alzheimer research centers that sometimes create barriers too. For example, that are not able to work with monolingual Spanish speakers. That would be a barrier if that was the kind of person you were trying to recruit more of to participate in research. We also see other barriers, no parking, 
my favorite one to yell about. No, no good parking, bad signage, uh, making it more and more difficult, not keeping appointments. Inadvertently, we see sometimes research center create these barriers to participating in pro progress. Uh, but a you know, consultant's dream is a disordered world. And so when we can find those barriers that have been inadvertently created by an Alzheimer's research center, we're glad to make a report to them and help them knock them down. Last, and I think this is starting to evolve, but we think uh, one trial we see in the Alzheimer's field, people trying to recruit just for one trial instead of trying to give people a menu of options to participate in and that include possible research that is not a clinical trial to get people going and to really not kill that spirit of altruism, that, that sense of caring about somebody besides yourself by participating in research, not kill that off because somebody can't make the inclusion or exclusion criteria for a study, but they might very well be able to participate in another one. So I think this is all ways in which I'm just making the appeal to you to consider it, uh, to consider your vital role in progress in Alzheimer's disease research in research into care and support. Next. This is Ireland. My, uh, I've done a lot of work with tribal people the last couple of years and I frequently get asked what tribe, Irish Catholic, and sometimes they laugh and sometimes they don't. But at any rate, uh, my grandfather came from Ireland and uh, if the Irish, if rocks had any value at all, the Irish would be the richest people on earth because uh, the place is just full of rocks. But grandpa used to say that to clear the fields when he was a boy, everybody would get out in the field, the whole village, the whole, the whole neighborhood, if you will, would get out on the fields and everybody would lift the rock that they could and make these walls. I think research is like that. If you can do an online survey, if you can fill out an evaluation form for a program that you've been a part of, all the way up to being involved in a year long clinical trial of a drug or an infusion and everything in between, pick up a rock that's the size you can and see whether or not it fits that you can help build the wall and improve our research knowledge and opportunities. Well, let me just say, next slide. Where do you sign up? Well, we're gonna try an experiment tonight. We're working with a couple of studies right now. Next slide. Uh, one is, uh, uh, this is uh, this is a list of, and this will be part of the recording and also Martha and her team will have these slides, but this is a list of registries. These are lists of, uh, trials and matching services to help people find clinical trials in their neighborhood. Uh, there's also the searchable database that maintained by the government called clinicaltrials.gov. And of course you can find all the National Institute on Aging funded Alzheimer Research Centers by going to the NIH, NIH.gov Alzheimer Disease Research Center tab that you see here. Next slide. We're working very actively with UCSD on helping them fill a trial. You can see here we're inclusion and exclusion criteria. We're currently enrolling men and women who have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's who are 50 to 83. You will get a series of tests. Depending on whether or not you're eligible, you'll be able to receive a stipend of up to $390 for your time. There's a phone number, there's a study coordinator, and now there's a QR code. So if you're really good and gifted with technology, I'm told, I'm praying that it works, you can actually take a picture on your phone of that QR code, and that will bring you right to the screening website for this Alzheimer's disease research study, study being conducted in your neighborhood at UCSD. In addition to that study, one of the things we've seen, next slide, because of COVID, is a number of trials have changed their caregiver interventions from something that's delivered in small groups or in workshops to online. We're working, this is a study from UCSF up, up north and Cal, as also in partnership with uh, Northwestern University in Chicago, testing 
LEAF, which is a, a, a life enhancing activities for family caregivers to see whether or not it makes a difference in their stress and how well they care for someone with Alzheimer's disease. Again, I think you can take a, try to take a picture of the QR code, but Martha and her team will have these slides. Last, uh, as I said, there's a menu approach. Uh, this is the last study where uh, we've been talking to people about, about setting up music and participating in music with patients with mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. So slightly different study. It's a 12 month study instead of a 24 week study. Uh, it's, it's on the East Coast and funded by uh, the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai's Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Uh, but again, you can see this is a typical kind of advertisement uh, for participation in clinical trial because it summarizes the study as well as who is eligible and who is not. So next slide. You moved on. This is our last one. There we go. Is our contact information slide. And now it's time for Martha to throw questions from the chat at me. Thank you, Mike. This was so informative. I hope our audience was taking notes. I was taking notes because it is true. We are so fortunate that just in our backyard, we have this uh, research hub trying to find the latest and the greatest as it pertains to uh, the people that we're caring for. And it is so vital if people, um, you know, if there's one message that we can give them tonight is that it's so vital for you to get involved and participate. Um, there are so many opportunities. I can't believe that there are 70,000 vacancies, you know, just medicine waiting to be uh, distributed, but it can't until we complete all the different phases that Mike was talking about. So again, all of you who are listening, who are tuned in, who are connected to us, um, who are really wondering, what can I do for my loved one? How can I help find uh, this medication, find the cure, find a way to mitigate some of these symptoms? This is the way. And I am so or glad that- Or find a way to be a better caregiver. You Absolutely. Know, I mean, it's about being a better caregiver. Uh, Absolutely. Again, think of the rocks. Pick up the rock again. The... Yes. And we know caregiving is not easy. I mean, if Mike is a caregiver, I've been a caregiver. All of us who have been caregivers, we do it because we love the people that we are caring for. But sometimes we don't have all the answers. And so that's why it's really important for you to connect to these different links that Mike mentioned. And again, we will provide those to all of you as well as um, a copy of this live stream once we are done in case you want to refer back to it. Um, also want to encourage you again, before we get into the questions, as you uh, start typing them into your um, chat box there, we want to make sure that you will know that Southern Caregiver Research Center is here to support you as a family caregiver. We have a lot of information, a lot of classes, programs that are evidence-based, evidence-informed, uh, that there's research behind it to try to help you with the, navigating this journey that you are on because it's not easy and we understand that completely. So again, if you don't have our contact info, uh, www.caregivercenter.org or scrc.care and our number 858-268-4432. And uh, let's get started, Mike. Are, are you ready for uh, the first question? <laughs> yeah, we just have... put your phone number in the chat, far away. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a question here from an audience member that says, how do studies discern between participants with Alzheimer's and those who just uh, who, who have dementia or are just showing symptoms? So maybe so some of the criteria. Any, yeah. yeah, so um, in the United States context, uh, increasingly, we're using biomarkers, that is blood samples and PET scans to look for the characteristic changes of the brain of Alzheimer's disease as the markers of whether or not someone has Alzheimer's disease. But you'll also see studies that are, are indifferent to what form of dementia somebody has, because they believe that dementia, the memory loss, 
confusion, the disorientation of time and place, the word search problems. It, 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 it's almost as if, and I think these are a lot of the caregiver studies, it, it doesn't matter how perfect the biology of Alzheimer's is developed. What caregivers need to know is what works. What caregivers need to know is how to be effective, how to not burn out. So you'll see a lot of the caregiver studies, whether it's an online or an online or an offline intervention. A lot of the caregiver studies don't ask for the level of biological information about what kind of dementia somebody has. Remember, dementia is an umbrella term. It's not a it's not a disease itself. Alzheimer's causes dementia, but it is it is not itself dementia. So I think that's what we see. Uh, that the, the, some of how the criteria, they also will use in terms of the different stages of Alzheimer's disease, they will use standardized cognitive tests. They will use, so to discern whether somebody's in a stage of subjective cognitive impairment, uh, which means I, I think I'm starting to have problems with my thinking or they're in a stage of severe dementia. There are some fairly rigorous standardized, easy to use, even validated in, in primary care tests that can be used to uh, discern at what level of cognitive impairment somebody has. Those tests don't determine what the cause of the cognitive impairment is, but they can say how, how much and how severe the cognitive impairment is. So I think it's a combination of cognitive testing, biological or it's called biomarkers, but in some cases there's a lot of research that is completely biomarker blind that needs participants to. Mike, our next uh, participant is asking a question which I think is is very important for caregivers here listening. You know, oftentimes, especially when it has to do with dementia, Alzheimer's, memory loss, um, you really need a caregiver to be there as well because it might be challenging for that participant to to actively or effectively answer some of the questions so that this person's question is can i join my husband during the study for support and help in asking questions and talking to the researchers yeah so the recipe if you will for us any study is called the protocol um, and that's one of the pieces of information you get in the informed consent process a lot of alzheimer's studies protocols call for a caregiver to be living in the home to help with transportation to round out what the patient experience is but i would tell you that increasingly as we're trying to test alzheimer potential treatments earlier and earlier in the disease process the the research centers are picking up more and more people who live alone with alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. and it's a real tension because the researchers also want to trust that what they're being told by somebody with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is valid. So it's a real mm -hmm. struggle in our community. But with 20 to 25 percent of people with Alzheimer's disease in the United States living in a single person household, let me say that again, a quarter of people with Alzheimer's in the United States live in a single person household we are missing out on a number of people, particularly if they're in the early stages and still well enough to maintain their living independently in a single person household, I would argue that they need to be able to participate in research on their own terms. But it's it's both an ethical and, a, and a, it's it's evolving. That's but a good way to put it because loans, yeah. that, that is very true. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is true. How do you not ignore that segment of the population when they could be a key to uh, the research as well. That's yeah. a good question. Um, I have another question here that is talking about, um, you know, when a person participates, how, let's say the person that is participating in the clinical trial becomes agitated or stressed out, what are, I guess, the protocols, what can the caregiver do in that um, instance? They, 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 they blow the whistle. <laughs> That's what those, uh, those hotlines that are, that are okay. well staffed by medical professionals, say if it was a drug trial and people were starting to show symptoms that were unexpected or side effects that were unaffected, 
I mean, anybody who's watching this YouTube video has seen these commercials with a long, you know, for drugs that have this list with a lawyer uh -huh. going 40 miles an hour <laughs> saying, yes. hey, hey, make your hair fall out, your eyes, your eyes roll and uh, make you fat. I mean, you know, but we laugh about those side effects, but that's how we learn about those side effects, mm -hmm. whether or not they're tolerable or not. But the, the first thing that the, the first thing that, and last thing that you'll hear in going through the informed consent process is here's who to call if something goes wrong. A friend of mine just finished up and just had published a massive study on apathy as a mm. underappreciated and, and treating apathy as a symptom of Alzheimer's disease, as a behavioral manifestation of Alzheimer's disease. And you can bet they had a whole team as they were experimenting with trying to reduce people's apathy. They had a whole team of people that were ready and standing by if things went west because they were using Ritalin, which is a neurocognitive oh. drug. You can't you can't mess with that stuff. So I, I think that's and, and even our friends in the LEAF study, even the caregiver studies, the online studies that we just showed you, the music study, even they have backup. See, and this is and so great stop. that you're saying, yes, that you're saying that, that there are, um, there is help. There is someone that they can connect you to in case there is something that comes up or, you right. know, like but, you say, maybe right. they just need to stop. But, you know, um, I, I think the wisdom of caregivers and family is paramount. If people are taking, even if it's not a clinical trial, if people are taking a treatment drug and it does not work as expected or, I mean, uh, I get asked all the time, and I'm not a doctor, and I don't play one on television, but I get asked all the time, what do you think, you know, what's the right time to discontinue uh, one of the licensed Alzheimer treatment drugs? And I mean, that's got to be a judge, that's a judgment call. And it's tough. You know, I, I, I hate when I have to substitute my judgment for my elders. And yet, you know, and you just what are you gonna do? You just got me thinking. Um, when I was a caregiver, I remember I was the, the obviously the primary caregiver for my great aunt who had dementia, and and I cared for her and took her to doctor's appointments. And many times, as I would observe her, I would uh, come to the realization that maybe we need to do something different with this medication. And I remember being that advocate for my aunt and saying, "Hey, you know, doctor, maybe we should." change it up or, or the dosage or can we figure out what else to do that is not causing her the side effect so i think as caregivers you know we still have that ability to say hey we want to participate in this research study however i think it's causing a more adverse effect than the benefit so this is what is happening yeah we caregivers as advocates is uh you know it's synonymous in my world so yes more that's questions true. that's Absolutely. We have a lot of questions. So one person is saying, um, um, would you be able to talk a little bit about the lumbar puncture test? Uh, sure. So one of the ways in which we get biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease is to look at the level of A beta uh, uh, proteins uh, caused by the plaque buildup in the brain in cerebrospinal fluid, in your, spi in your spinal fluid. And we don't, in the United States, uh, get a sample of CSP, cerebrospinal fluid, by putting a needle in people's brains. That's kind of dangerous, it's tricky, it's dangerous, it's terrible. So instead, a lumbar puncture is the use of a very fine needle hopefully by a very skilled clinician to draw out a very small amount of cerebrospinal fluid from between the different joints in your back. That's what a lumbar puncture is. But increasingly, I mean, there was a time 20 years ago when a lumbar puncture uh, was painful, scary. It's still scary, less painful, and there's a lot more skill and you can al always, uh, if, if a protocol calls for uh, lumbar punctures as a way of testing for amyloid plaque in your cerebral spinal fluid, you can always talk to the center about the best way to do that kind of a test. 
in the end, Mike, that's why there's a race for blood biomarkers because everybody's used to giving blood and it would be a lot easier than doing LPs. Mike, our next question is talking about, uh, maybe you can mention a little bit more about any risks when people participate in studies. I mean, I guess beyond the, the obvious ones, but um, any other risks for caregivers to consider? Again, these will be disclosed. The specific risks will be disclosed in the informed consent process. And so whether you look at the LEAF study or you look at a drug study, there's a list of uh, what the risks and benefits are of participating in the study. Um, I mean, one of the big risks is disappointment. This has been a tough field. The brain is tough. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, uh, I think there's also a risk to our time and to our energy. But all of those are disclosed, all the known risks and some of the unknown risks are disclosed in the course of doing informed consent. And they're going to vary from study to study. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but that's... That's what I got. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> that is great. Um, when for for drug trials, for drug clinical trials, do volunteers uh, would volunteers find out whether they do receive a placebo or not? If and I know the there's different goes, types, so maybe you can talk no, about no. the different but types. If, if so, in a phase three trial, if the trial goes long enough. Um, and they filled their quota of participants, uh, folks will, the, the process of being either placebo or treatment is called blinding. So the, even the researchers are blind to who's getting the placebo, the sugar pill, and who's getting the active treatment pill. So, it, and, and, and they, all they know is, so the data is blind, the investigators are blinded. If we fill a trial, and if a trial reaches a reasonable conclusion, the results are unblinded and are shared with the individuals. And in many cases, depending on the company, if people have been taking the experimental drug, even if the drug doesn't go on for approval, but they feel like there's been a benefit, they're able to continue to use that experimental drug under something called an open label uh, investigation. That means that I mean, there's some compassion. Uh, so there are people, uh, I know there are people in San Diego that were part of a clinical trial of a drug that did something about tangles that removed some of the, which is the other physical change in Alzheimer brains. And Tau RX, the company finished their trial. They unblinded, that is, they said, okay, you were getting placebo, you were getting the treatment drug. And the folks who were getting the treatment drug were actually given access and still have access almost a year later to that treatment drug if they wanted to do it on an open label basis, uh, even though it hadn't yet been approved by the FDA for treatment for everybody. Good question. Yeah. No, we have a, a lot of questions. Um, I was wondering, Mike, if there is anything, uh, obviously we're, we're talking to a lot of caregivers, a lot of caregivers who might be caring for someone with some sort of cognitive de decline. Um, how would you, what is it that you can tell caregivers as it pertains to their involvement, their impact of these studies on them? Uh, if these studies are specifically for the person with the brain impairment or the cognitive decline, what is the, the the commitment to the caregiver? Well, I think um, uh, certainly some of the uh, perks, if you will, is probably uh, participating in research is a more refined diagnosis than perhaps you might get from a primary care physician. Um, also, many Alzheimer's studies, because of its burden is not just on the person with the disease. Many Alzheimer's studies also measure whether or not the treatment, a, a tre the treatment has any impact on caregiving, such as, so my friend who just finished this big study on apathy, one of their big uh, points of their study was that if you find apathy and you treat apathy, what happens to the amount and the types of caregiving that have to be done if you treat apathy. 
how do you find out? Well, you have the caregivers are real. They're embedded in the study. They're doing a diary. They're they're providing data for the study. So I think uh, it's also very common for caregivers to fill out questionnaires about their burden. Uh, people will do the Zaret burden scale, which I know you guys also use. Yes, we do. Tool Absolutely. for your so again evaluation research. See, you're already if you're going to services at Southern Caregiver Resource Center and filling out those evaluation surveys, you're already participating in a form of research, and it didn't hurt. So I think uh, the Zaret burden scale is frequently used, uh, as well as these caregiver diaries to kind of see what's the the overall as an ecosystem of the family. What's the overall effect of the treatment? Mike, these are a great, uh, a great insight into some of these questions. Any last thoughts or comments that you would like to leave the audience with? I know we're kind of running out of time, but let me remind our audience that we will be sharing this link again at some point in case uh, you want to take down notes again and, and watch it. And we'll have, maybe we can have the slide with Mike's uh, contact info right now so you can see it and maybe jot down the phone number and the website for Splain Consulting. But any last uh, comments, Mike, that you would like to um, share for the audience? No, I think, um, you know, I. I've been really reflecting. This has been a very busy week in Washington. It's the 100th mm -hmm. anniversary of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the 241st anniversary of the founding of the Marine Corps, Semper Fi, San Diego. What can I say? Uh, that's today, by the way. But it's also the 50th anniversary of uh, the establishment of the war on cancer. And I think where we are in cancer is where we'd like to be in Alzheimer's and dementia research. And it's going to start small. It's going to start with symptoms such as my friend who just finished this big study on apathy. It's, you know, everything isn't going to come all at once. But the um, the best job I know of in the world, a friend of mine has who's an ethicist, and his job is to run a setter for the study of altruism. What is it that makes human beings give a damn about each other? Because I will tell you, 99% of the people that queue up to volunteer and research, know they're probably not doing it for themselves. They're doing mm -hmm. it for their kids. They're doing it for the next generation. They're doing it for somebody else. We know that a, an absolute treatment for Alzheimer's disease, even a decent disease modifying treatment is not gonna be immediate, even after 30 years of research. So I think it's that, I, I, if you have that spark of altruism and you're curious by what I've said today, Check in with Martha, check our website, get back in touch, help us help you find a menu uh, of options to participate in research. Don't just think it's pills and infusions and lumbar punctures. There's a lot of other ways to participate that are respectful, dignified, and safe. Uh, but please jump into the game because uh, it's not a game and, and we need volunteers. Simple as that. Yeah. And if you're not yet hooked up to the Southern Caregiver Resource Center, do that first. 858-268-4432. Great people, uh, wonderful partners, friends of longstanding, and absolute caregiver Aww. experts. And they know it from the inside out because 90% right. of their staff has lived the dream of being caregivers. Absolutely. We know firsthand what it's like. Mike, it's been a pleasure oh, like always. And by like the way, then. some of them even speak Spanish. That's right. <laughs> we do. We speak Spanish. And all of our services are free. So you cannot beat you that. Um, please yeah. connect with us. Let us know how we can support you. And then, of course, yeah, Martha, um, maybe we'll come can... back and do, do our hospitalization workshop someday. That'll be Let's fun. Let's do it, Mike. Thank you, my okay. friend. Good it's, to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Have a good evening. And thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon. Take care.
Oh, thank you, thank you. Is Mike 